Hello. So let's talk about one of the most important inventions of all time. One which made it quick, cheap and easy to accurately distribute information and change the course of history. No, I'm not talking about Tim Berners-Lee's internet, Google search, or Facebook social media. I'm talking about Johann Gutenberg's revolutionary 15th century technology, the creation of a machine that allowed for the mass production of books for the first time in human history. What made Gutenberg's invention so revolutionary compared to its predecessors was his introduction of mechanization in the movement of movable type to paper. What Gutenberg did is he took 15th century technology in use in wine presses, linen presses, and papermakers' presses, and he applied it to the production of books. Yeah, we familiar with this story? Yeah, great. So, what happened? The prices of books plunged. And what had been a rare luxury item for a wealthy few became available to the many. Literacy rose. Information was made available to people in a way that had never been made available before. It's facilitated through its rapid production mechanism, the facilitation of the spread of scientific reasoning, all contributing to the Protestant Reformation, the Renaissance, the scientific enlightenment, and ultimately the Industrial Revolution. Now I would suggest that as data professionals sat here today, we are all experiencing currently our own Gutenberg moment. And what is that Gutenberg moment? The fundamental disruption driven by the advent of cloud. The separation of storage and computation, which makes available to us for the first time the ability to truly manipulate data at enterprise scale. So, let's talk about that a little bit more. We know, don't we, that cloud storage and cloud computation is making advanced decisioning possible. Um, but possible, like the introduction of the book, to even the smallest of players. You will have seen, like me, that at AWS reInvent this year, 13 additional machine learning services were launched. I would assert that 90% of today's startups would not be possible without the advent of cloud computation. It's getting ever easier for competitors, for disintermediators in all of our industries to access what has historically been the preserve of the few, advanced algorithms and machine learning. And what's interesting about this is just like the 15th century book market, the economics of this industry are different, aren't they? The cost of cloud storage and computation um, are, are lower, cheaper, faster, and there are new economics associated with the digitization of the way we work. Yeah? Lower costs of weight, waste, um, increased in ability to experiment because the costs of that experimentation are so much lower. So I believe that we really are standing at one of those turning points in history. We are standing in a position where, as a group of data professionals, data democratization at enterprise scale really is in our grasp. So let's have a little look at Sainsbury's. Um, we are a very well-known brand. Thank you, Richard, for supporting my family by buying <laughs> your food from Sainsbury's. Um, we have a really long-standing reputation for quality. Uh, fine foods pervade at fair prices. 
from 1,400 shops up and down the UK. We've been doing that from a, for 150 years. What some of you may be less close to is that from a butter shop on Drury Lane 150 years ago, we have subsequently, subsequently acquired a stable of other well-known household brands. Uh, Argos, now part of Sainsbury's, Two Clothing, the fifth largest clothing retailer in the UK, Habitat, um, Bank and Nectar. So a very, very different business in the modern day incarnation um, of the brand. Now, our data vision as a group is to know our customers better than anyone else, so as to better anticipate and meet their needs. Um, and that's really my role. Think for a second about the amount of data our enterprise throws off having some of those businesses I've just described. Yeah? Uh, the UK's largest loyalty scheme in Nectar I've mentioned the size of our clothing business, the fact that we have a bank, thousands of shops, hundreds of thousands of colleagues, and millions of customers. My role is to catch that data, to collate it, and make it accessible to colleagues across our business, to enable them to creatively explore that data, to unlock business decisions in new and different ways in order to think differently about the way we can best serve our customers. So, it's the customer that lies at the heart of Sainsbury's Tech. Sainsbury's Tech is a new organisation that has launched in the last week in Sainsbury's and brings together for the first time technologists that have historically been tied to one of our individual brands. We've brought together all our technologists in one division in order to provide the multi-channel, multi-brand capability that's necessary to serve our customer in this digital age. This is a quote from uh, our CEO, Phil Jordan, and you can see him expressing why we feel it's important to do that. We feel it's important to do that because we want to be able to see the customer in 360 degrees regardless of the brand or channel they choose to shop with us from. So what do I need to do, therefore, to underpin that strategic objective of knowing our customers better than anyone else and to meet this ambition of seeing the customer in 360 degrees? In realising our data vision, we're going to be doing three fundamental things. Firstly, we want access to data to be as ubiquitous and easy as breathing oxygen. Secondly, we want to really support our colleagues in becoming more knowledgeable, to help them unlock their creativity and satiate their curiosity about the way decisions are made in our organisation. And thirdly, we want to reduce human decisioning in the most complex end-to-end -end network decisions in our business. Examples being, for example, end-to-end -end management of stock. So our data vision talks to those three things. If we're going to know our customers better so as to better anticipate and meet their needs, it means we need to be so much better than we are today at prediction and it means we need to be so much better than we are today at optimising decisioning. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Okay. Now, we have a mind-blowing amount of data as a group of brands and channels. Um, I've represented some of it here. We have telemetry on all our vehicles, both in logistics and in our online operations. We have um, a significant amount of data coming from the farms in which we source our milk, our meat, our fish, our poultry. We have information about our competitors. We have customer information. We have uh, data about stores, the assets in those stores, the longevity of our fridges. Um, this is really why I do my job. Sainsbury's is a phenomenally exciting place to work if you're into analytics because of the sheer volume, breadth, variety and depth 
of the data that we hold. I believe we're probably sitting on the UK's preeminent data asset. And we've started the really hard yards of making this data available, um, useful and consumable by everyone, not just the few. Um, because, not unusually, and many of you here are from large enterprise, not unusually, um, data tends to be locked to division or business function or indeed brand. And we are trying to change that to democratise data. In Sainsbury's, we are actively analytical. We are constantly asking questions about how can we put our data to work to address the biggest opportunities in our organisation? How can we change the way we operate to better serve customers, change the way decisions are made? And I, in thinking about how I facilitate that, have to be extremely customer-centric as I think about the ecosystem I'm creating to change the way we're organising our data, how we're making it available across the enterprise. So we're focused very much on three key customer groups. The first group is what we would call citizen analysts or citizen consumers of data. These are individuals who are typically in our commercial functions, the folk that buy products on behalf of Sainsbury's. They might sit in our finance function and increasingly uh, many of them sit in our retail operations teams. So how can we support the citizen consumer in accessing information in a world in which they will currently describe a long, arduous prioritisation process to get their simplest queries answered? The other two communities are more represented in this room. We have a very significant analytical community and also a community of data scientists and machine learning engineers. And their common problem statement is the difficulty of accessing data when it is locked away by domain, by business function or by brand. It stops them being brilliant. And what these groups share in common is firstly a concern with what is described as the many versions of the truth problem. Yeah, driven by inconsistency of definition inconsistency of understanding of quality. Secondly, they share in common a concern with the patchy and siloed nature of the data, driven by, as I say, our operating company um, design and by the way divisions have historically guarded information. And thirdly, really very patchy access to different tools um, and an ecosystem that's complicated to navigate. I'm hoping some of this is resonating because these forums for me are always a bit like therapy when I find out I'm not alone. <laughs> yes? Good. Okay. So what are we doing about this in Sainsbury's? This is what we're doing. Lordy, buckle up. This is a diagram, isn't it? <laughs> this will get your juices flowing. So this is what we call Aspire, a strategic platform for insights and reporting. Um, we are building this ecosystem of connected capabilities and technologies because we have reached the point of understanding that there's no way forward in our legacy tech. We know that the realisation of our data vision, you saw those three segments, is absolutely dependent on the data. And that is why we are driving extremely hard on a plan to ensure that the very many transactional systems across our enterprise are publishing data to this ecosystem, Aspire. So don't worry about the detail. This is very incomplete. What this represents is, by logical area of our information reference model, the thousands of core transactional systems across our group of businesses. Yeah? We are building the pipelines to ensure that those systems can publish. When they start publishing, we are tagging that data for PII, hopefully no PCI, and other forms of data. We're dropping it in our raw storage in AWS S3. 
We are then performing basic curation on it as it moves into Snowflake, um, and then it moves through into the presentation layer of Snowflake. Why do we think about these things in, three, in these three ways? We think about them in these three ways because of the three customer needs I described. So our science and machine learning community um, want to access that very raw data for experimentation, for early proof of concepts um, in scientific experimentation. The citizen consumer, on the other hand, the store manager at Nine Elms, wants to be absolutely assured that when he's looking at yesterday's sales and waste figures, it's completely tidy, robust, buttoned down, and believable. So this is where the typical visualization tooling that we're providing um, through MicroStrategy, uh, Power BI, Tableau, we've got the full smorgasbord in our group, um, is accessing very robust data from the Snowflake presentation layer. So as I say, we realize how imperative, imperative it is that all of those transactional systems uh, publish. And that's really the big business transformation we've been on over the last 18 months, making it safe for stakeholders to understand that if they publish data that has historically been held within their domain, bad things won't happen. We want the revolution of Gutenberg, the freedom of information, the spread of ideas, the standardization of information, um, and that's uh, why it's imperative those transactional systems publish. Now, ours is an increasingly complex operation, and the trade-offs we're making are more nuanced than they've ever been. And we recognize that the days of operating to and with the average are long gone. It's no longer good enough to look at uh, availability for a subcategory. It's important now to start looking at availability by SKU, by store, by day. Now, even three or four years ago, that would have been an impossible dream. And again, to emphasize the Gutenberg freedom of cloud, this is now possible. We now have the scale of computation necessary to over 30,000 SKUs in 1,400 shops understand that kind of information with that granularity. And we've been looking to the future as we built out that ecosystem I described as a spa to make sure it's truly future-proofed for the advent of um, really high-quality, high-cadence prediction. What my team are doing in the science community um, particularly, is ensuring that we can provide truly scientific, systemic, automated, and data-driven decisions to complex recurring problems. And, you know, we can have this debate, but for us, that's a nuance between what science is and what analytics is. S true science at enterprise scale, ML at enterprise scale, is the provision of high cadence solutions to complex, high recurrence problems where you have competing objectives. So we're making complex decisions using extremely complex variables, competing objectives um, with a degree of uncertainty. That's, that's what we're now doing and we're predicating that off the Aspire, um, off the Aspire ecosystem. So to bring that to life, I just want to share um, a use case with you, uh, which is one of replenishment. So every day um, we will deliver what this, this is called a delivery unit. Every day, something like 130,000 of these things are coming into the back door of our shops every day. Um, you can see it's a big pallet, it's cling wrapped, um, and it has a variety of products on it. If you've ever had the joy of doing in-store working to support our colleagues at Christmas or Easter, you will know um, how complex it can be to make decisions about whether you should break that pallet down or not in order to expedite getting that stock to shelf as quickly as possible to support our colleagues. So we identified that this this problem, this problem of the decision about whether to break this pallet down or not was one that was worthy of science because it's complex 
Those pallets are not stacked in the same way in every shop, in the same way every day. And we identified as well that depending on your decision about whether to, uh, to break down that pallet or not could fundamentally affect how far the colleague had to walk as they traversed the store. Um, a colleague can walk thousands of kilometres in the course of a working week um, um, doing that task. So we created a machine-readable format of every single store plan across our estate um, and the location of every single product on every single shelf in every single store across our estate. We started tracking in real time those inbound deliveries to the back door and we built an algorithm that optimised for the colleague the decision of whether to break down or not in order to create the shortest possible walk time between um, the stock at the back door and getting the product to shelf. Freeing the colleague up to serve customers. Yeah? So I think this is a really good example of uh, data science at scale in a retail operation. I think we can all be guilty of defaulting to customer analytics when we think about a business like Sainsbury's, but to be honest, this is where the really fun stuff happens if you're a retailer. Yeah? Really, really interesting problem to solve. So as I say, the algorithm works out the best breakdown routes and route to shelf. The floor plans and shelf plans will be turned into usable data for the first time. And the algorithm is deciding whether the delivery unit should be broken down onto rollers or not. So let's talk about the operating model that makes that possible. Because it has significantly matured, I would say, over the last 12 months. This is work led by Ender Ridge, our chief scientist, author of Guerrilla Analytics, little plug, it's worth reading that book. So our analytics, uh, sorry, our data science and machine learning operating model is represented here. We are offloading complexity and generating new data. So what does this model represent? Firstly, all algorithms that we're building um, for the purposes of um, science and ML are hosted centrally as services. Why do we do that? We do that for consistency, efficiency, reliability, and maintainability. Because those algorithms are used by multiple customers increasingly. Secondly, algorithms consume data from the lake, that diagram I showed you. Those algorithms are consuming data directly from the lake. But importantly, because of the principle that we have that all transactional systems will publish, we are also ensuring that we're closing the loop by those algorithms publishing data back to the lake. And this is very interesting because that is generating new data assets for the organisation we've never had before. You know, the information about the decision of whether the colleague accepted or declined the recommendation of the algorithm about whether they should break the uh, delivery unit down or not is an example of a data asset we've never had before. So we're ensuring those algorithms publish data back into the lake generating new data, but also making it possible for analytics to generate new leads, yeah, set off new lines of inquiry that perhaps we've never had access to before. So, as we look to the future at Sainsbury's, as we realise our data vision by quickly, easily and cheaply distributing accurate information, we're really aiming for a future in which there's absolutely no limits on our colleagues' ability to satiate their curiosity about our multi-channel and multi-brand business. Thank you. <laughs>